Hello, today I'm going to have a close look at the 1995 String Trio by Brian Bernihau. Brian Bernie Howe is an English composer. He was born in 1943 in Coventry, which is a city that lies in the geographic center of England. In the years immediately preceding his birth, Coventry was severely damaged by German air raids. The city center was completely leveled. Fernie Howe has said that some of his earliest memories consist of walking to the town square with his mother and having to weave through all of the different bomb craters that were left by the Germans. And some writers have commented on the fact that his later preoccupation with damaged structures may have some sort of a connection with this early memory. But Brian Fernihau in England, generally speaking, were not a particularly good fit. He was unable to find a teacher in England that would be sympathetic with his particular musical leanings. There was a certain conservatism in England in the years after the Second World War, and what he was really interested in were the radical experiments of composers like Stockhausen, Boulez, or Edgar Varese. In fact, he had an LP of a piece by Edgar Varese called Octandre, that he listened to so many times that by his own admission he completely wore out the record. So he was also preoccupied with trying to understand how these pieces work but not really quite succeeding because of a lack of documentation and a lack of competent teachers. So he would try to imitate the surface qualities of works such as Stockhausen's Gruppen for three orchestras but without really knowing how those pieces were put together technically. So it took him a while to piece together a functioning technique. And one of the really interesting things about his compositions is that because of the fact that he was largely left to his own devices and had to come up with his own vocabulary essentially from scratch while trying to make a synthesis of all these different strands in music that were so fascinating to him, he ended up elaborating a lot of techniques that were deeply personal and completely original. So he ultimately decided to move to the continent to study composition, initially in Amsterdam with Ton de Leo and then later on with Klaus Huber, a prominent Swiss composer in Basel. In addition to his prominence as a composer, Brian Fernihau is a very highly sought after composition professor. So he taught in Freiburg, Germany for many years before moving to California where he still lives. And in addition to his positions as a professor, he's been giving regular master classes all over the world. And it's not an exaggeration to say that he's had a profound impact on multiple generations of composers through his activities as a teacher. I'd like to just talk about some of the general aesthetic qualities of Fernie Howe's music. So the first thing you can say about it is that his music tends to occupy a register of radical complexity. This has been fairly consistent throughout his entire career. But it's not just any sort of complexity. It's a complexity that comes from the mutual interaction and interference of different strands, or what he would call lines of force. You might have three or four different materials going on in a piece. They're evolving at different speeds and in different directions at the same time. And so while any one of these individual lines might be fairly straightforward, what happens is he crashes them into each other, and what you end up with is a damaged structure of a certain kind. So this results in, first of all, extremely unique forms, but it also results in a certain kind of chaos as well. And he's very, very interested in the sorts of complex and very interesting and very unique structures that result from this way of working. And they're structures that you really couldn't elaborate any other way. So he might take three or four different rhythmic strands and, and force them to interact with each other in such a way that you end up with a final result that is basically one possible collapsed reality out of all of these initial starting points. The other interesting thing about his music is that because the processes that are used to generate it are so extraordinarily complex, you end up with a surface quality in the score that tends to slightly overstep the bounds of what is actually possible. So nothing in his scores is actually technically impossible to play, but there's so much information in them that a performer is forced to make choices in order to restitute a final image of the piece for the public. You just can't have 100% accuracy when you're performing a Fernie Howe piece. So it's extremely interesting to compare different performances of his pieces because obviously it's the same work and the same formal characteristics are there, the same type of expression and so on, but different performers will tend to put the emphasis on different aspects of a piece. So there might be the performer who's extremely preoccupied with getting the, the microtonal pitches exactly correct. There might be the, the performer for whom rhythm is an absolute priority, the performer who tends to insist more on tone color and gesture. So you'll have a, you'll have a different approach to each piece 
based on different performances. However, these are not open works in the sense of John Cage or works such as Stockhausen's 11th Klavierstücke, where you have fragments of music uh, scattered all over the page and the performer has to glue them together. These are fully worked out works that have a coherent shape and a coherent form to them, but they just have this extravagant excess of information that affects not only how the performer puts the music together, but also how the listener's perceptions will work, because you cannot take in all of this information. You're forced to momentarily focus on one detail and then another detail and try to keep up with it. There's a kind of too muchness about this music. So you have this interesting sense at all times of being just a little bit behind and having to really run with your perceptions to, to make some kind of a, a coherent linear narrative that makes sense to you in your memory as you work your way through the piece. So it's certainly music that makes enormous demands both on performers and on audiences. It's often described as being some of the most difficult music to play ever written, but it's also extraordinarily exciting to listen to. And one of the things about Fernie Howe is that it, it's something where you're entering into a new universe that has an entirely alien set of postulates. It has a, an entirely new set of axioms that, that we're starting out from. And so you can't really listen to this type of music with the same expectations that you might bring to a classical work or even uh, a more moderate piece of 20th century music. You, you literally have to adjust your perceptions in order to survive in this new perceptive environment. And one of the things that strikes me is that that's not altogether dissimilar to things that happen in certain works of art. So for example, when I go to the Louvre and look at a painting by Rembrandt, very often his paintings are extraordinarily dark and the, the pigments that are used are often very close together so that when you first come to the painting, you might actually not be able to differentiate all the different planes and, and the extremely subtle use of depth and so on and the shadows. Your eyes literally have to take a few minutes to adjust to the scope of that painting, to the fact that you have a, a limited range of brightness in that work. And then once you've had a few minutes to get used to it, then all sorts of details start coming out to you and you start seeing the full richness of the painting. Another good example is the 20th century abstract expressionist painter Ad Reinhardt, who deliberately worked with an extremely restricted range of hues in his paintings. So he would take reds and greens and blues and darken them to such an extent that they were almost indistinguishable from black but not quite. You'll look at an Ad Reinhardt painting and it's extremely interesting because at first you basically just see a black square, but then once your eyes have adjusted to it, you start to see that there are indeed these minutely differentiated shades. So this is kind of similar to what's going on in Fernie Howe in the sense that the level of overall complexity, the, the amount of information is just radically beyond what you normally get in a piece of music. Once you've sort of acclimatized yourself to this new perceptive space, then you can start to orient yourself a little bit more easily, but it can take a few lessons to get used to. So I'm going to talk specifically about the 1995 String Trio. Now this is a very interesting piece historically because in the 1990s he starts working with a program called Patchwork. Patchwork is a piece of software developed by IRCAM and IRCAM is an institute in Paris that is devoted to advancing new technology in the service of music. So it could be development of synthesizers or programs or devices that allow computers and musical instruments to talk to each other and so on and so forth. And Patchwork is a very, very interesting program. Now, it still exists today, but in a different form. It's now called Open Music. And what this program is for, really, is taking any sort of musical idea that can be formalized. In other words, that can be expressed in a way that is understandable to a computer. And then the computer will generate all sorts of different variations on a given type of texture based on the input, based on the composer's initial instructions. So a lot of different composers have used Patchwork and later on Open Music to help generate very complex types of textures that would be either extraordinarily tedious and slow to work out by hand or simply impossible to conceive any other way. And this sort of thing is actually ideal for Fernie Howe because in the earlier stages of his career he would develop these extraordinarily complex pre-compositional strategies. So before he would actually start working on the score he would have all of these rules in place that would determine the parameters of the piece. How do you generate the rhythms? How do you work out the pitches? And so on and so forth. And oftentimes it would take him weeks just to work out a single strand in a, in a piece before he would even get to the other aspects of the composition. So his music is fundamentally parametrically written. In other words, he'll, he'll build up a score layer by layer. He'll start by working out the large scale metrical structure, and then he might start working on the rhythms, and then he'll add the pitches, and then he'll start working in the details of the timbre and the dynamics and so on and so forth. So he really just works 
layer by layer. Very, very interesting way of working. So in the case of Patchwork, he tended to use this program starting in the 1990s to work out some of the rhythmical structures in his compositions. So the advantage of working with Patchwork is that instead of, again, having to spend weeks working out some of these things by hand and then having only a limited amount of variations to work with, with Patchwork, he could put the exact same input into the program, the same basic points of departure for what he was trying to do, and have the program instantly generate as many variations as he wanted on it. So he could generate way more information, way more materials than he actually needed for the piece, and then sift through them and sculpt them and shape them in a much more intuitive manner. So this was a tremendous help for his compositional process, and you see this being worked out in a very convincing manner in the 1995 string trio. So the string trio is structured in four main sections. And this, this actually calls to mind the classical string quartet. However, what's happening in this piece is a little bit different in the sense that Ferniho is, again, very interested in damaged structures, structures that are somehow compromised, so that you can't quite perceive them, or they, they somehow break down or they stop functioning at a certain point in the piece. So he starts out with what appears to be a very clear set of postulates for each movement. But as you work through the piece, it's gradually interrupted by a series of what he calls interventions. So these interventions are little fragments of music that are completely alien to the rest of the piece. They're, they're just non sequiturs. They have nothing to do with what came before or what comes afterwards. They both break up the flow of the music and they also force you to view what just happened and maybe what's about to happen with a little bit more distance. So at first these, these interventions are just these very short little fragments and they do what they have to say and then they stop and then you get on with the piece. But as the piece continues, the interventions become more and more prominent until by the end, you're no longer actually clear what is an intervention, what is a fragment of one of the main sections. It becomes very ambiguous and everything basically starts to fragment and break down. So there's four types of interventions in this piece and they're numbered one to four in the score. So the first interventions have to do with the use of eighth tones, so extremely small micro intervals that are being used and they're, they're only used in this first intervention. The second intervention has a completely different type of texture, basically a two-part texture, where you have a solo instrument that's playing basically a continuum of 32nd or 64th notes, and then you have the other instruments playing this very rigid mechanical staccato music. In the third interventions, what you have are chords that are almost together, but not quite. They're just a little bit off kilter. And then in the fourth intervention, you have this, this very slow regular mechanical rhythm being played by all four instruments, almost like the sound of a, of a ticking clock with silences in between each iteration. So the project of the piece goes beyond just the, the overall form, the formal strategy that I just described. There's also something else. Ferniha loves to tie in his music with the, the vast history of music, generally speaking. So in the case of the string trio, what he did was he, he investigated the entire history of the string trio as a genre. So Fernie Howe is somebody who has written a long series of string quartets. He's very associated with the string quartet genre. And the particularity of the string quartet is that it's basically a discursive medium. In other words, you'll have an element A and then a contrasting element B, and then these two elements will enter into a dialogue with each other. And over the course of the piece, they will eventually become synthesized. So you have an antithesis and then a synthesis. So the string trio genre has tended to work in a very different manner. So the earlier examples of the genre seem to have more of a divertimento type of quality. In other words, lighter pieces that are a little bit more entertaining, they're not quite as heavy, and they tend to be made up of a series of shorter movements. So often in the sense of a Baroque dance suite, for example. And in the 19th and 20th century, you start to see the string trio almost disappear as a genre. In the 20th century, there are very, very few examples of composers writing string trios. There are a couple of famous examples. So Webern wrote a string trio, and so did Arnold Schoenberg. But these pieces really don't have any particular cohesion to them in terms of belonging to a genre. They're just very, very disparate. So he's interested in the fact that the string trio is kind of a genre without being a genre. It has no particular cohesion to it. He's also interested in the fact that in the string trio, unlike the string quartet where you have two of the same instruments, so you have two violins, and then a viola and a cello. In the string trio, you have only one of each. You have one violin, one viola, and one cello. This actually turns out to be extremely significant. So in, this, in the string quartet, you have two violins. That allows you to have orchestrational effects. When you have two of the same instrument, you can have uh, a vastly uh, varied number of different types of texture and different combinations of instruments. And in the string trio, you can't really do that. Each instrument is cruelly exposed, and you're very, very aware of the individuality of each instrument. It's very difficult to have a full sound, a full sonority, and an or orchestral texture. So the, the challenge of this particular string trio was, how does he create the very full and, and thick 
textures that his music is associated with using only three instruments. And in the string trio, he succeeds brilliantly. It's a piece that's absolutely hyperactive. It's, it's got extraordinarily interesting textures going on all the time. So we're going to have a closer look at exactly how that works. So I can't possibly do a full analysis of this piece. It would take hours and hours and hours. It, there's so much going on in it. But I'm just going to zero in on certain aspects of it. I'm going to have a look at the first section, and then I'm also going to look at the intervention. So the first section is labeled mesto in the score, which is an Italian word meaning melancholy. And it starts out with a very, very compelling viola solo. So this first section is actually a series of solos for each of the three string instruments, followed by what the composer calls amplifications. So in other words, you'll have an instrument that starts and it will expose a certain type of sound world, and then the other two instruments will enter and also amplify and extend the idea initially stated by the soloist. So each solo explores a different dimension or a different quality of music. The viola solo explores a static harmonic space, and it's characterized by a certain form of doubt and hesitation and tentativeness and stasis. So we're going to listen to that in a minute and you'll see exactly what I mean. The violin solo is much more extroverted sounding. It's got two different rhythmic layers going on simultaneously, so there's a polyphonic dimension to it. And then the cello solo is like a parody of a romantic, uh, hyper-expressive, sort of, oh, woe is me sort of solo. It's, it's, it's actually quite funny. So Fernie Howe has a, a wicked sense of humor, and he's always sort of parodying and exaggerating some of the expressive tropes of classical and romantic music. And so he takes this idea of the individual expressing themselves and just takes it to a, a ridiculous extreme. So let's have a closer look now at the viola solo. So I mentioned that it explores a fixed harmonic space. So what do I mean by that? He takes this microtonal scale. So in other words, using quarter tones, intervals smaller than the smallest intervals that you can play on a piano. And he affects each pitch to a particular octave. So in other words, every time the pitch F sharp appears, it will always appear in the same register. Every time a B one quarter sharp appears, it appears in the same octave and so on and so forth. So the, the registral space is fixed and there's a fixed number of pitches that he's allowed to use. So in other words, there's, there's no harmonic evolution. You just have this fixed space. All of the notes are sort of stuck in the same spot at all times. And every time they reappear, they reappear in the same octave. So that's a very interesting strategy, but what he does in order to animate this space is he has a, a constantly varied series of rhythmic figures and especially of different tone colors. This viola solo also occupies an extremely narrow range of dynamics. So you'll, you'll notice when I, when I play an excerpt from this solo that we remain in a dynamic register of, of three Ps, of pianississimo, so very, very, very soft, delicate sounds, and he further makes these sounds delicate and fragile by using playing techniques that are really on the, the edge of controllability and audibility. So for example, colegno tratto, which is a technique that involves playing with the wood of the bow, not, not the hair of the bow as you normally do, but the actual wood. So that produces this very unstable, sort of hesitant kind of glassy sound. And the other thing about it is that he stays in the extreme high register of the viola throughout. So that's not the sort of standard register of the viola. And, and he also avoids the fourth string of the instrument, which is in, in a certain sense, maybe the most characteristic part of the instrument's register. So we're, we're, we're stuck all the way up in the stratosphere in the least characteristic register of the viola. And on top of that, he's using all of these very strange, fragile playing techniques. So why don't we listen to it now and I'll, I'll put the score on the screen so you can see what that looks like.
Okay, so now I'd like to have a quick look at the violin solo. So the violin here is treated as a very brilliant, extroverted instrument, and this is in a complete contrast to what was going on in the viola solo. And then it's also constantly exploring this sort of polyphonic idea, where you have two rhythmic strands going on at the same time. This is very, very difficult to perform, incidentally. So the, the violinist has to play these extraordinarily complex rhythms that are asynchronous and that are piled on top of each other and sort of find a technical way to do that. So often you'll have one finger doing one rhythm, another finger doing another rhythm, and he's doing it on two strings at the same time. So it's extraordinarily complex. But it's also got this very brilliant, very extroverted quality. So let's have a listen to the violin solo. Okay, to finish off, I'd like to play for you just the cello solo. So the cello solo, again, is this like is this ridiculous parody of a very expressive lyrical cello solo, and you'll see that it's, it's zipping all over the place, very, very large intervals, very sort of exaggerated use of vibrato, uh, and a kind of theatrical, gestural quality to it throughout. Okay, so what we just heard were a series of solos. I've cut out the amplification, so you'll need to go back and actually listen to the piece if you want to hear those. But the point is, the opening section is very structurally clear. It couldn't be any clearer. You have a series of three solos followed by a series of three amplifications of each. Okay, so at this point, the structure of the piece really starts to break down, and we start getting more and more formal ambiguity in terms of what is a section and what is an intervention. So what I'd like to do next is have a look at these three interventions and what sort of music they're playing and how they function. So I mentioned earlier that the interventions basically serve to disrupt the flow of the piece. So I'm going to have a look at what I actually mean by that. So here at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the complete score of intervention number one. So it's only two bars long. So this is a very short little fragment. But again, it's a completely different sound world to what we've had before. So only in intervention one and its variants do we have the use of eighth tones. So these are extraordinarily small intervals. And what he does is he, he, he defines a, a little tiny space. So he might be moving from, for example, C sharp to C natural, but he has this granularity to it. So you have all of these tiny little microtones in between those two notes. And on top of that, he has these repeated rhythms going on in this, in this texture that are asynchronous and they're piled on top of each other. So you get a very, very compelling, very unusual sort of texture. So let's just have a listen to intervention one. Okay, so in intervention two, what we have is a very different sort of strategy. It's, it's described by the composer as having a kind of rigidity, a kind of mechanical quality to it. And actually what's going on here is you have two rhythmic layers. You have one rhythmic layer that's more or less continuous, a continuous flow of very rapid notes. And then the other layer is marked by these very sort of staccato, rigid, short little interventions. So this is a texture in two parts, and again, radically different from the preceding intervention, but in the piece itself, they're just sort of stuck up next to each other. There's no particular reason why two should follow one. There's no causality. There's no organic connection between the two. These are just non sequiturs. 
Intervention 3 has yet another texture type that it explores, and this is a texture of chords that are almost together, but not quite. They're just slightly off, and, and, and they can move in such a sense that they become gradually more distant from each other or gradually closer together in terms of the, the attacks being together. Okay, so now I'd like to talk a little bit more about the rhythmic procedures used in this piece. And incidentally, the image here on the bottom left of the screen is taken from an unrelated work by Tristan Muraille, because you can use patchwork to generate pitches, chords, harmonies, rhythms, whatever. But that's just a little screenshot to show you what the working environment of patchwork or open music looks like. So in the examples that you've seen so far of the score, you'll have certainly noticed that the music is extraordinarily complex from the point of view of rhythm. So you have all of these what are called tuplets or nested tuplets. In other words, complex compound irrational rhythms that are sort of nested in, into each other. So you'll have an overall bracket of, let's say, 11 eighth notes in the space of, of nine eighth notes. And then on top of that, you'll have 11 sixteenth notes in the time of seven and so on and so forth. And you, you might have as many as three or even four layers of these tuplets fitting inside of each other, sort of like Russian dolls. And I think one of the most interesting aspects of it is the fact that it's, it's not music that's just sort of coldly calculated in a kind of mechanical or mathematical manner, not at all. What's really interesting in Fernihau is the fact that you have this collision, this head-on collision of two radically opposed ways of working. So on the one hand, yes, he does have to formalize his thinking in order to generate some of these rhythms. There is a highly formalized procedural constraint-based aspect to his work. But on the other hand, you have the, the sort of hot spark of inspiration that is sort of taking this raw material and sculpting it and shaping it in a very intuitive manner. So it, there's also a certain kind of spontaneity in the actual realization of his music. So in order to work with patchwork, you have to be able to formalize your musical ideas. You have to be able to express them in a way that a computer can understand. So in other words, if you're working with rhythms or pitches or whatever it may be, you need to be able to express your ideas in terms of numbers. So in the case of this particular piece, they're expressed as a list. So let's have a look at a particular list, and I'm going to explain how this list is transformed into conventional rhythmic notation afterwards. Okay, so the first thing we see here is the list has an opening bracket and a closing bracket, and what that tells us is that it's one bar of music, one measure of music. Okay, so after we have the opening bracket, we have the number four. So this initial number tells us what is the number of beats in this bar. Now, it doesn't tell us if it's a bar of 4-4 four, four, or 4-8 four, or 4-16. It doesn't tell us, in other words, the, the, the size of the beat unit. It just tells us how many beats there are in that bar. Okay, so the bracket after that, we see a series of numbers, 1-1-1-1. One, 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 one. So this simply tells us how many individual pulses there are going to be in the bar and what their respective length is. So in the case of this bar, we have four equal pulses. So that just is the same thing as a bar of 4-4. Four, four. So we can see what that looks like here. Okay, so hopefully so far so good. Now I'm going to look at a slightly more complicated example now. This next example starts the same as the previous one. So we have an opening bracket, then the number 4. Again, that tells us that there are four beats in the bar. Then another opening bracket. And then we have three times the number one. Okay, so far it's the same as the previous example, except that after we get to the third one, we have another bracket that opens up, and inside that bracket, there are three more ones. So what that means is this third beat is going to be subdivided into three equal beats of its own. And then after that, that bracket closes up, and then we have the number one at the end. So the final beat is going to be just a regular beat, but the third beat is going to be divided up into three pulses. So now I'm going to have a look at how Fernie Howe generates some of the more complex examples using this technique. So here's an example of a procedure that is developed by Fernie Howe in the String Trio. So in order to elucidate this procedure, I have looked at this particular book. So there's a wonderful article in here by the composer and researcher Mikhail Malt. 
So Michael Malt is a Brazilian musician who works at IRCAM, and he worked with Fernie Howe on developing the sub-programs or the patches that are used in patchwork in order to write aspects of this piece. So the interesting thing about Fernie Howe's music is that unlike a lot of 20th century music, where if you if you basically know how the composer is working, you can sort of figure out what the successive steps were that were used in order to, to write it. In the case of Fernie Howe, this is basically impossible just because there are so many different strands piled up on top of each other and interacting with each other in often very complex and chaotic ways. So that you have this extremely complex surface, but if you were to only have access to the score and try to reverse engineer it and figure out what were all the steps that were taken in order to result in this surface, well, it would, it would just be impossible. So you really need to either know specifically what the composer's procedures were, have access to the sketches. So I'm, I'm very grateful that this book exists because it's, it's just a great help in understanding how this music is put together. Okay, so let's have a look at this example. So you'll see at the bottom of the screen, we have six examples, A, B, C, D, E, and F of different rhythms that are produced with patchwork. Okay, so let's just look at our example A here. So aspects of it are going to be familiar from what we already looked at with our previous example. So we have an opening bracket followed by the number four. So again, that tells us this is a this is a four beat bar. Now that doesn't tell us the number of pulses or individual notes in the bar. It just tells us what is in the time signature. So that tells us that there's going to be a four in the time signature. Okay, then another bracket opens up and we have the number one. So, so far that's identical to the previous examples. So then after that, we have the number two, and then another sub bracket opens up, and we have the number three, another sub bracket again, the number four and five, then those sub brackets close up and we have six at the end. So what this means is that with all these sub brackets within brackets and so on, we're going to have tuplets within tuplets. That's what that basically relates to. So the first thing you can observe about this list is that it's a list of consecutive numbers. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So, Okay, so let's let's start from there. So you'll notice that if we count up all of the main pulses in this bar, so I'm not I'm not talking about the the brackets within brackets, the, the subtuplets and so on and so forth, but just the basic number of pulses in the bar, here's what we end up with. So we have to add one plus two plus three. So that gives us six. Now the three, we then have a bracket that opens up and we have four and five in, inside of it. We're gonna ignore that for now. And then at the end we have six. So that's six plus six. So that means that we have 12 equal pulses in this bar. So there's a problem. Well, obviously 12 doesn't fit in a particularly obvious or rational way inside a bar of four, four. So that means that we have to have an initial tuplet bracket that allows us to, to squeeze 12 into the time of a four, four bar. So the easiest way to do that is to imagine that, that we have 12 eighth notes in the space of eight eighth notes. So normally in a bar of four, four, you would have eight eighth notes. So here we have 12 in the time of eight. Okay, so that allows us to fit in all of the pulses that are in this unit, that are in this set of, of pulses. Okay, so the first pulse that we have is the number one. So that means we're going to have an eighth note. Okay, next one is the number two. So that means we're going to have a quarter note. So in other words, uh, something that's equivalent to two eighth notes. So far, so good. Okay, when we get to the next pulse, we see that it's, it's a three. So that would be normally equal to a dotted quarter note, except that after the three, we have a bracket opening up and we have the numbers four and five. So that means in the space of a dotted quarter note, okay, we need to have four plus five equal units. That means there's gonna be two beats within that third beat and they're going to have the, the, this proportion of, of four to five to each other. So in other words, four plus five equals nine. So that means we're going to have nine in the space of six. Okay, I hope that's clear. So that means nine sixteenth notes in the time of six sixteenth notes. And that is going to be divided up as follows. You're going to have a four sixteenth note pulse followed by a five sixteenth note pulse. A quarter and then a quarter tied to a sixteenth. Okay, then those sub brackets close up and then at the end we have six. So something equivalent to six eighth notes. So that's that would be a dotted half note. So you can see here at the screen what that actually looks like when you translate it into normal musical notation. So that's what you end up with. Okay, so pretty abstract, pretty crazy, but that's that's how this works. What happens next? I'm not going to go over every single example in detail, but what happens next is very interesting. What he does is he takes this list of numbers, this list of consecutive numbers from one to six, and he rotates it 
So that list number two, instead of starting on one, it starts on two. So you go two, three, four, five, six, one. Okay, then the third list starts on the number three. So three, four, five, six, one, two, and so on and so forth. So you're just rotating the values of the list. You're shifting them over by one space each time. And then the result of this rotation is then transformed into rhythmic notation. So what you get is a series of variations on this initial list that have a constantly changing uh, internal structure, okay? So what that means is the, 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 the disposition of, of different densities, of different pulse duration and length is going to be constantly shifted around in a completely unpredictable manner. So then what he will do is he'll take multiple strands that are like this, of different procedures being carried out on lists, various types of variations and so on, and, and dispose them polyphonically in the score. So he might create an initial matrix, just to give a random example, of like 10 different layers of processes like this. And then he'll boil it down into three parts by saying, okay, I'll take this bar here and this bar there, and I like this one, so I'm going to use that one, and so on. And he'll, he'll just very intuitively shape the material and, and find the parts of it that he likes the best or that, that suit him the best in terms of the, the types of textures that he's trying to create. And that will be the result. That will be the, the basic rhythmic structure of the score. So I hope that was interesting and illuminating and tells you a little bit about how Brian Hernihau works. So it's, it, it can be extraordinarily complex uh, understanding some of his compositional techniques, but I don't really think that's the point. The point is that what you end up with is, is this extraordinary object that you could just not have possibly arrived at otherwise to, through any other means than the way that he has chosen to work. So it's, it's really a, a very, very unique type of music. Again, you, you, there has to be a certain level of suspension of disbelief if you're going to enter into the world of this music and, and, and enjoy it. But I guarantee you, once you are able to do that, once you're able to sort of throw aside your, your prejudices and, and your expectations in terms of what you think would happen in a quote-unquote normal piece of music, there's an entire universe of fascinating discoveries to be had in Brian Fernihau's music. If you have some patience with it, if you give it a few listens, I think you'll be struck by the extraordinary surface sensuality of the music, its, its physicality, its drive, its intensity, and the incredible inventiveness of the composer. So stick with it, it's absolutely worth it, and I hope this video provided some keys, at least, for understanding how it's put together.